everybody. My name is Kim Hargrave and I'm the Education Director at the Denison Pequot Seacoast Nature Center. And today we're going to talk all about a particular group of birds called the Corvids. And these birds are actually an amazing group. Here in Connecticut, we have three different types of Corvids. We have birds that are jays, we have crows, and we have ravens. All right. This is also a crow, and I have one bird that doesn't belong in our group, and we'll talk about him in just a few minutes. Now, all of these birds have a few things in common. One is they're incredibly intelligent. If you look at the brain size of these birds compared to their mass or their body size, they are on the same scale as our great apes and our intelligent dolphins and things like that. All right, so these birds are incredibly smart animals. And that allows them to be very adaptable animals and sometimes get into mischief. Um, these birds will also use tools and have pretty complex social structures, which means just like we have families, these birds tend to have families and they have ways to communicate with each other. So absolutely incredible and really, really smart birds. I'm going to talk about each one for just a few minutes, and I'm going to start right over here with the jays. Now, depending on where in the country you live, you might have other types of jays. Here in Connecticut, we only have the blue jay. So blue jays are a small bird. Believe it or not, their feathers are not blue. They're actually brown. And the way we see the blue, it has to do when the light hits it, the way the light scatters through the feathers always makes blue jays appear blue. Male and female blue jays are the same. They look exactly the same from the outside. So you can't look at a male or a female blue jay and know which is which. Now sometimes blue jays get a little bit of a bad reputation for stealing eggs and things like that. But scientists have done some studies with these blue jays and they found that the egg predation that blue jays do has no real long-term consequence on any of our local songbirds. So appreciate having blue jays around. One thing that blue jays can do is they are excellent mimics and they'll actually mimic other bird calls including hawk calls. And so we have a blue jay that lives outside here at the nature center who has got the red-shouldered hawk call down perfectly. And so I'll hear it and I'll be like, it just sounds just a tad different. So we go out and we search around and now nine times out of 10, it's actually not the red-shouldered hawk, it's the blue jay making that call. Scientists think one of the reasons why they learn these is so that they can actually warn other birds that there is a red-shouldered hawk in the area and know that it's a danger. So blue jays can live an incredibly long time. They can live up to 20 years in captivity. Obviously, it's a little bit shorter out in the wild. So predators for a blue jay. Unfortunately, the number one predator right now is our pet cat. So really important to try to keep your cats inside. They'll help, they'll help our blue jay population. Um, other predators, though, might be a bobcat, a snake getting into their nest, things like that. So an incredibly smart bird that we have around here. Now, you might have noticed a few years ago that our population of blue jays and crows went way down. And that was because of the West Nile virus. Corvids, so blue jays, ravens, and crows are incredibly susceptible to West Nile and our populations pretty much crashed all over Connecticut. Those populations have come back up again, but every year we still get birds into the nature center that have West Nile, and most of the time they don't survive. So having crows and blue jays come into us sometimes is a sign that West Nile is present in our region. All right, let's talk about this next bird for a minute. All right, this guy is the American crow. We actually have two species of crows in Connecticut. A lot of people don't realize that. We have the American crow and we have the fish crow. It's really, really hard to tell the difference. Sometimes the easiest way to do it is by looking at their habitat. Fish crows, just by the way they're named, do prefer to be near bodies of water, especially the shoreline. They're much more likely to be along Long Island Sound than they are in inland locations although we have seen their range start to expand, especially up waterways. 
So if you think about the Connecticut River, the Thames River emptying out from Long Island Sound, you know, sometimes those birds will come up the riverway just a little bit. So fish crows look almost identical, but they're substantially smaller than our adult, our, our American crows. So this is the American crow right here, and this is the most common one that you see here in Connecticut. All right, so crows have a beak that is super adaptable. They can eat lots of different types of things. One thing they can't do though, is if an animal gets hit by a car, they can't be the one to actually rip it open and start trying to eat some of the flesh. They actually have to depend on other animals like vultures to start eating and then the crows can come in. Take a look at these feet. All right, so we've got three toes in the front, one in the back, typical of our perching birds. And these feet help them to grip onto lots of different places. And this is why crows can be found in many different areas. Crows being smart, all right, know how to live around people. And so the more you talk to people, the more crow stories you start to hear. A lot of people end up kind of befriending or having a funny relationship with a crow that's in their neighborhood or in their yard. Um, you know, they'll, if you leave out something shiny, the crow might take it. Now we don't want to do that because we don't want to put litter into the environment, but sometimes that happens just naturally. And crows, crows pick up on all of these cues. They learn about people's habits. And so if you constantly leave your garbage can out on Tuesday nights, because that's garbage night, they will pick up on that. And they'll know on Tuesdays, we want to gather at so-and-so's household because they're not good about putting the lid on the garbage and they will get into it and in every routine and they'll get into that routine and they know to look for it. So My sister's crows have learned uh, when she takes the compost out yes. and they are very well tuned to that. Yep. Um, can we interject for just a second? We're going to cut over to Rosie who's up at the top because as someone noted, we hear some cooing. So I'm just going to go over there so that way you can see. So as people are chiming in, especially our veterans that have been joining us quite a few times, do you see that white bird that is moving up there? So that is Rosie. She is our white pigeon. And she also seems to really enjoy our Facebook Lives and um, the extra attention that it gets her. So for everyone that is a big Rosie fan, here's your Rosie fix for the day. She might fly over as we keep going along. All right, so back to Kim. Um, we also have some people chiming in that they have crows or especially blue jays. And then we have Steve Johnson that tunes in from California chiming in about the stellar jays that are out there. That's right. So out in California, it's actually pretty funny. I was doing environmental education out there for a few years, and it's funny, kids have in their mind, they've heard of blue jays, even if they live in California, and they call the jays that I'd be doing out there, they call them blue jays. Like, oh, don't have blue jays in California. <laughs> so depending on where you are, though, there are jays almost all across the country. Different species live in different places. They're all smart, and they're all super adaptable. All right, so just a few more things about crows. Crows can actually live a very long time in captivity. Um, one crow was known to live up to 59 years, which is just absolutely crazy. Crows can learn multi-stepped puzzles. That's how intelligent they are. So they can learn that, oh, in order for me to get the treat out of the jar, I've got to take this stick, I've got to break off the end, I've got to put it in the jar to pull out the treat. So they can pick up on all those steps and learn it. They'll actually will use tools, things like that. And there are stories in the UK of, um, of crows that learned traffic signals. And there were some hard nuts that they weren't able to crack. And so they would wait for the light to, to turn red. So that way they could hop down, put the, uh, the nuts down, and then when it turned green, that the cars would run over the nuts to split it open. So they are so intelligent. So one thing that you will know about crows is crows do flock together in the winter time. And so sometimes you get big masses of crows in one particular area for the winter. And so these are called their winter roosts. And during the day, they tend to spread out. And then at night, they all come in together. And those roosts can be a couple hundred to thousands and thousands of crows in one particular area. And they all communicate. So crows do that call, call, and that's usually they're announcing themselves, announcing their presence to their family and to other crows in the area. But they do have an incredible array of vocalizations that all mean different things. So crows are nesting right now. They have their young. And what happens is crows tend to stay with their parents for a couple of years. They usually will stay for at least one or two years before venturing out on their own. 
Most crows don't start reproducing until they're three or four years. The younger crows that stick with mom and dad will actually help raise the babies that year. And that actually will help their success rate. You know, more uh, adult birds taking care of the young ones give them a higher chance at survival. Now let's talk about ravens for just a minute. So this is something really interesting. If I had been doing this program about 20 years ago, I would have said, eh, we don't really have ravens too much here in Connecticut. They tend to be further north, but that has changed. We now do have ravens in Connecticut. I went out back to feed the owls like about two weeks ago, and I heard this sound, I'm like, that's a raven. And I look up and there was a large raven, you know, flying out over the woods um, right behind the nature center. It used to be that I'd find them at Lantern Hill. So if you're familiar with that place that's in um, right near Ledger or Foxwoods Casino, uh, right, that's where I'd go and look for ravens because they do like what we consider higher elevations and Lantern Hill is one of our higher elevations here. These guys are amazing flyers, all right? They're just, they're acrobats in the sky. They're very adaptable. So they have, they go from the Arctic to the desert, but they do prefer places that they can fly and get a lot of height. Now, what they do when they fly is they glide a lot more than a crow. So while ravens are larger than crows, sometimes it can be tricky to tell the difference at first glance. So in flight, there's two things that we look for. One is how they soar. So they keep their wings out for a longer period of time where crows are continuously flapping those wings, only soaring when they're coming in usually for a landing. Well, ravens will do a lot more soaring and like I said, incredible acrobats in the air. There was a scientist who was studying some ravens and one of them he watched fly upside down, so on his back, flapping for a half mile before you know flipped over again and started flying regularly. Young ravens will do stick drop games. So they'll fly up high, they drop a stick, they come down, they try to grab it before it hits the ground. All right, so those are kind of the games that we play. And so ravens will do that in the air. They like to do flips, they like to do loops, and that's why being at a higher elevation or somewhere off a cliff or off a ledge is a better place for them so that they can actually get um, enough thermals to ride those without, so, so they can soar without having to flap their wings a lot. Now, a few other ways that you can tell the difference between crows and ravens um, when they're flying is the wing shape. So a crow's wing or tail shape um, tends to kind of curve down. It's a little tricky to tell on this, all right? But you can see that it's a little flatter where a raven's tail has, you can actually see it pretty well on this guy right here, More tends that to have v. a diamond, kind of comes to a point just like this. So that's one of the ways you're gonna tell a raven from a crow when it's flying. The other thing that we're looking at is this thick beak right here. So a really heavy, thick beak that, well, the crow, you might think, has a thick beak. The raven's is remarkably larger. Okay, so okay. we're looking at the raven right now, and then we're going to go over to our crow. We can look at that crow Seems beak. Seems much more pointed. Much more pointed. The raven actually has a little bit more of a hook that comes off the end, which might remind you of a raptor. All right, and that is helps them so that they're scavenging, because we're... Um, Ravens do tend to be scavengers to a certain extent, very adaptable to lots of food, but that can help them to pull meat off, things like that. A lot of ravens in places in the country where people hunt a lot, they know if they hear a gunshot, oh, it might be worth checking out to see what, you know, if a deer was taken. They also, ravens will follow wolves around up in the north and they know to wait until the wolves are starting to finish up and then the ravens will actually come down and, um, finish up the meal for them. So very, very intelligent birds that not just within their groups, but have learned to read all the different cues in nature to make it easier for them to find food and for them to survive. All right, so can we have a couple of questions? We had someone that was just asking, I'm just gonna scroll through here and hopefully not flip my phone like I did yesterday. Um, they would like to know what the feathers are called that are right above their beak. Oh, on the they raven. definitely have a special name. I'm not thinking of it off the top of my head, but you're right. They okay. have these special, and um, all corvids do tend to have them. So if you look, you can see them on the um, 
on the crow as well and i'm blanking on the name that's at the okay moment, we can but... share it later someone also wanted a up close shot of our blue jay here and so again you can see that they have those special feathers right above their beaks um so we have someone that also was chiming in that they have a bird that a black bird that has been hanging out um, by their bird feeder with a brown head ah excellent all right so that is a is not a member of the corvid family so that is one of our blackbirds and that is a bird called the brown-headed cowbird and that's the male brown-headed cowbird um grackles as well are not members of the corvid family they're another blackbird so the brown-headed cowbird that you have is a native bird here in connecticut they're an interesting bird because um, they don't make their own nests the female will actually sneak into other birds nests and lay an egg in other birds nests and then she doesn't raise her own young um, you know the other parents of whatever bird she's managed to put her egg in will actually raise that young as well so they're they're an interesting bird to have around um so we have a question from cheryl and emma and they would like to know why are crows attracted to shiny things so that is a good question and i'm not exactly sure what the reason is but it's well proven that they are but i don't know why they they like those shiny things right and there are some other birds that are drawn to different things i'm thinking it might be the the brower bird that is attracted to blue objects in particular. So um, sometimes they just have their favorites, much like we do. Um, Tamara is asking if there are jackdaws in the United States. Oh, are there jackdaws in the United States? I know that they're in Ireland. Yes, so I'm not sure if they are any in North America. I think they might be more of an old world bird. And same, and jackdaws are in the Corvid family as with um, magpies which are really fun and again they're very very smart birds yes. i'm just going to scroll back through we answer the questions um someone was wondering why do crows bring presents there's someone that they know that um is routinely getting gifts from their crows so for some reason that crow is feeling like they have a relationship with that person maybe they put out food things like that and so they figure oh if i put keep, keep, keep giving that person attention they keep on giving me food they, they do figure that out um Crows have an excellent memory, and so if there was a good thing that happened at that person's house or something like that to that crow, they're going to continually remember that. Crows also, though, have a good memory for holding a grudge, and so scientists who work with crows usually end up having to wear masks because if they do banding, so they go up into the you know the nest and they ban the chicks, those adult crows look they look at you and they know you versus another person all right and they're going to be like yeah that's a bad person they tried to take our chips and they will remember that and they're going to teach their young and their family that you are a bad person and so it's very interesting um this one scientist who you know did have, you know he didn't hurt any crows but he did a you know a scientific study where he was banding some crows well they didn't like it and the first year, he'd just get attacked by mom and dad crow. The next year, he'd get attacked by mom and dad and babies. The following year, it was the new babies, mom and dad, and a bunch more crows. To the point where it got like, if he tried to come near the crow roost during the wintertime, it was a large communal roost, over 60 crows would come at him. So he always had to wear a mask after that so that he'd look like a different guy. So they'll hold a grudge and they're going to teach people teach other crows about the dangers that are in the area. So that's an incredible adaptation to be able to spread their knowledge from one bird to the next. Now, um, it's always interesting that different collections of animals have different names. So a group of crows is called a murder. Do we have any idea how that came to be? I don't know. So there's so many stories and things about crows and ravens, you know, ravens from Native American lore, from European lore, um, you know, about being tricksters or very smart and intelligent birds and things like that. So it, it's hard to say why a group of crows would be considered a murder, just, you know, their coloration or um, the just just their, their smarts or maybe going after things. It's hard to say. All right. I'm just going to scroll through because we've had lots of great comments. Um, where are the closest magpies that someone might be able to spot? Again, we don't have them here in Connecticut. I'm not sure. Um, the closest ones I've ever seen are in Europe. <laughs> so it's hard to say. Um, okay. So 
We have a few others again. So Linda is finding big chunks of glass in their yard, and they suspect that it's crows bringing them oh. a gift, maybe? It might be, yeah. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, I can see them definitely bringing, bringing that in as a little present, make a little pile. So they don't often see it happen, and so they're maybe just try to keep track and see what happens. So, yeah, I'm um, really interested to see if that was a, um, um, a a crow continuously bringing it to them. Maybe. And game cams are always a fun thing if you guys can set them up. If you are experiencing some sort of interesting behaviors, um, it's really nice to be able to see things and capture that footage. So that way you can really know what happens because, again, animals tend to adapt and will be more active when they know that we're not out in the yard. Yes. Um, so, Linda, that might be a great chance to check out. Um, so someone is asking about the differences in sounds. And also, if you call them with a call... Do they hear and respond to those sounds? Sometimes they will, absolutely. So especially if um, you know you're familiar, if they're a familiar face. So if it's a crow that's in your yard, just not like a random crow that you see when you're out hiking, um, you can start to have a communication with them. So ravens have a very different call, and we can maybe share some links later on about the different, the two different calls from the birds so that you can hear them. All right, perfect. And someone's chiming in that there are magpies out in Cal uh, Colorado, so Excellent. thank you for that. Um, lots of people saying, so a blue jay landed in someone's yard on the back of a chipmunk at their cabin. Was it territorial or trying to eat it? It was probably a territory thing. So actually a blue jay and a chipmunk would eat some of the same seeds. And so um, what would happen is that that chipmunk was stealing stealing which it's not stealing it's getting its own food but the blue jay thought it was getting seeds that it could have it would go down and um, chase the chipmunk away blue jays have very little fear and same with crows and ravens and that's why they will attack animals that are bigger than them you will see crows um when you see crows like mobbing a tree they're all coming down yelling at a particular tree look carefully in that tree often there's an owl or a hawk in that you can also see them soaring, you know, the hawk will be soaring and the crows will be coming down and dive bombing it. Ravens don't stoop to the level of having to dive bomb it. They basically will come on all sides of that hawk and just fly out of its territory. Ah, so, so I did watch two crows in my neighborhood um, earlier this week that were going after a very large female red tail hawk. So. Okay. Just letting her know that they were there and then perching in the tree beside her. So they're quite brazen. And that, that activity, when they come down, is called mobbing. And so they'll mob different, um, what they consider predators, or in this case, maybe even a seed stealer. So. Well, and someone else was chiming in, again, back to our Blue Jay here, of theorizing that perhaps some of the mimicry that they're doing is to... Um, scare the other birds away from their bird feeders so if they think that a hawk is there um they, i guess they've witnessed that around their feeders i, I believe that that would call you know the other birds would be nervous go away and the blue jay's like eh, excellent got the feeder to myself again you know using those very large brains that these birds have so to to, to their advantage all right so. so kim to recap for those that are here in connecticut and as we Here's predicted, Rosie. Rosie wanted to come and say hello. Rosie is um, not a Corvid. No, okay, Rosie so. is definitely not a Corvid at all, um, but she's checking everything out. So we have three species of Corvid that are so here have, in Connecticut? We have three. We have crows, we have ravens, and we have blue jays. Again, ravens are expanding their range. So if you look in our older field guide, it may not say that we have ravens here, but we definitely do now. So don't think you're going crazy when you think you see a raven here. Um, so we have ravens, crows, and blue jays. Now, the thing with crows is we have two species of crow. We have the fish crow and the American crow. This is an American crow. Right? All right, and Steve Johnson was chiming in. So he's our friend that tunes in from out in California, and their ravens actually chase the golden eagles out there. So I believe it. Again, these are really smart, um, intelligent creatures and you said that their their brains are in relation to what size so you know they, if you think about them in relationship to other animals that we think of as intelligent they're on the same level as our great apes and dolphins things like that so very very intelligent can use tools hi rosie and rosie also wants to get some attention yeah. all right so everyone thank you for tuning in today we are going to be coming to you live next tuesday wednesday and thursday at 10 a.m so hopefully you can join us then all right. have thank a great you. day